So now I, I will to use some animation. I used to work on these animations since I was at the bar of many years ago. I don't have more time, but I still use them. Though these animations are very long. Uh, they, they did back 20 years. But it's good to have an overview of the approach. It's basically, I tell always my fellows, they need to have more eggs in the basket. They don't, know, they don't need to do one single approach because that's the only approach they know how to do. That's why I always emphasize with young guys just to go to the lab, train. In, during, during your training, train to learn as many approaches as possible. And then yourself, you decide which one would be best suited for that particular patient. And this very valuable time you spend in learning this stuff now, that once you are in your clinical practice, uh, later on in your career, it's very difficult you're going back to the lab or you're going back to learn these approaches. That's why you'll be a little limited with your armamentarium. So that's a good time to do it. Uh, I'm trying to do, again, I'm trying to squeeze in this time the most I can. We start from anterior approaches, as you can see here. Uh, with some, there is a lot of variations. So if I want to talk about all these variations for each single approach, it will take me an hour only for each single uh, surgical perspective. So I try again to make a little short so that we're going to see the anti purely anterior approaches uh, with the subfrontal and uh, supraorbital. We're going to see anterolateral, which is the most important is the peterional approach, some modification of peterional approach, like a frontal orbital zygomatic. And I'm going to mention a couple of variations as well. And then we're going a little bit more lateral Sorry. Uh, and being more lateral in this approach, and we're going to uh, consider all the transpetrosal, subtemporal, anterior petrosal, posterior petrosal, and then we're going to go posterior lateral, retro sigmoid, um, uh, and the, some of the trans, uh, posterior transpetrosal approaches, the far lateral. Um, we won't have much time. I would like to see if we can cover also the supraterbella impedentorial, interhemispheric, and some of the transcalosal approaches. Uh, but to make it short, the three most important ones we use mostly for skull base are the anterolateral, mostly the orbital zygomatic with all the variation, the lateral, the transpetrosal, and posterior, mostly the far lateral approach. With these three approaches, you can gain access to the entire skull base. So from the entire clivus, from the top of the clivus, namely the posterior uh, clinal process, all the way down to the frame and magnum. So these three major approaches, which you really, I really suggest anybody to master. This is not something for a pure skull based surgery. Everybody, I think, should be able to, 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 to get familiar with these approaches. You can gain a good exposure to the most difficult challenge in pathology, particularly the basal skull. And I'm going through the OR setup, something that you guys are familiar because you've been rotating through the OR. Surgical table is very important. Electric, I use a lot because I like moving the patient. That's why it's important to secure the patient properly to the table because you want to be able to move that table a lot because that's a way to increase exposure, avoid brain retraction and overtaking obstacle. Surgical position is something I spend a lot of time with my fellows and my young residents because uh, if you just do a good positioning, if you position a patient properly, your life is going to be much easier. Um, the most common one is the supine approach, the lateral approach, is a lateral position, of course. And the idea is just, I always, uh, always say all the time, to keep the vertex down as much as you can, in this case, particularly in the supine for anterior approaches, anterolateral, vertex down 15 degrees. Uh, but it's important an next extending. The head is always to be above the heart because you, you want to avoid uh, uh, blood pooling in the brain and makes every dissection a little bit more difficult, brain swelling. So you work a lot with anesthesiologists. It's important, remember, it's a teamwork. Make sure the airways are always clear. And the problem is just make, make sure that the head is in the most neutral position. Even if you rotate the head on the other side, it's important to understand you don't want to cause any uh, occlusion or partial occlusion on the vessel on the other side, because otherwise it will cause a venous engorgement particular common sinus, the, the, the venous plexus around the vertebral artery, for example, it makes the, the, the surgery real complicated. Uh, but the, the major point of group positioning is to avoid obstacle, to go around the obstacle and trying to minimize brain retraction. So a maximize exposure. So I, I, I will go through some of these positions as we talk about the approaches, uh, but just to, just to understand, what I, I think the most recommended approaches, uh, the, most, uh, the one I recommend the most, are the basic one for all intracranial procedure, 
uh, would be the supine and the lateral oblique. Um, I don't like mostly the prone or some, some people like even the supine when they use, uh, for example, suboccipital approach. But in that case, you need to rotate the head too much. So when I do suboccipital posterior force, I always use a lateral position, like so-called park bench. I do some modification of this approach because I'll show a little bit later. Usually I put the arm under the table to avoid, to avoid brachial uh, practice injury. Uh, but this allows me to put the head in the most neutral position. Instead of turning the head um, too much on the other side, that will cause some venous engorgement. I rotate the body of the patient, so in this lateral position, as you can see. So that's my preference. But again, everybody is on its own preference. Um, let's start from uh, purely anterior approaches. This is a subfrontal approach, which is a very good approach. Uh, you can see in this, again, is overviewing. Uh, it could be like unilateral, it could be bilateral. You can involve the supraobular rim or not. There are different variations. I'm going to mention a little bit of this one. But as far as the exposure area, is is very good because you can expose the, the entire anterior carna frossa, the cella, and with a bilateral extension as well. So it's a very good approach for cranial pharyngioma, planum sphenodalum meningiomas, and some aneurysm on the anterior circle, particularly, for example, ACOM, or A1, uh, and even A1 on the other side. So it's a very good approach, and it's very basal as long as you learn how to shave the supraorbital ring. The head, as you can see in this case, is, is a, uh, at least 15 degree vertex down. I will, in this picture, as you can see very well, I would uh, extend the neck a little bit more because the head, remember, has to be above the heart. All right, so that will avoid uh, um, blood pooling and brain swelling. But again, just uh, the fact that you position with the vertex down allows the, the frontal lobe to fall back, even that centimeters is important to just minimize brain retraction. So all these tools are extremely essential. And then you can see the different option for a unilateral subfrontal approach. One is the purely basal without touching the supraorbital rim. The second one is involving the supraorbital rim. This allow even in minimize even further the, the need for brain retraction. This is very option, a very good option, and it's important to train for doing this one because if you do properly, cosmetically is acceptable as well, as long as you know how to replace properly and you don't want to drill too much bone after you've done the approach, otherwise it would be difficult to fill the gap. That's why it's good to plan this approach uh, um, before you start opening, right? The other option in doing, including the bilateral extension. In this case, we can see we go on the other side as well. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.